Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Headley Park Church on this glorious Sunday morning. Glorious because the sun is shining and glorious because the music group are over there. The big pool there is open. The water is warm. And we're here to baptize three people. My name's Simon. Uh, I'm one of the leaders here at the church. And it's such a joy to see you. If you're here every week, if it's your first time in the building, you're really, really welcome. And if you've just turned up seemingly at random, you've picked the right day to come. Today, we're going to baptize three people. One from Zimbabwe, one from Argentina, and one from about 10 seconds that way. <laughs> so it's a, a, a real nice mix today. And today is going to be focused a little bit on them, but mainly upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is common to each of them, the one who is common to every member of the church here who calls upon his name, who says, Jesus is my savior, Jesus is my Lord, and Jesus is my friend. And so as the service goes on, there'll be lots of different things that are all about Jesus. We're gonna sing about him, we're gonna hear from the guys who are being baptized, we're gonna hear from Neil, my colleague here at the church, who's gonna tell us a bit about a part of the Bible, and then we're gonna see as our um, brother and sister go into the water and it's all right, come out again. It'll be fine. So, lots of things going on. If you've never been in the church before, you've never been here before, don't worry. Uh, we'll lead you through and basically just stand up when everybody else does, sit down when everybody else does, and you'll be fine. And keep an eye on the screen. So, we're going to start by singing uh, a couple of songs. Now, the first one should speak for itself. It always comes top of the list when it comes to Britain's favorite hymn. The second one will be familiar to lots of people who come to the church apart from one bit, okay? Because we're going to sing a bit of that song in Spanish, okay? Now, I know about two words in Spanish, and I've already forgotten them, but Talia, who is half Bolivian, is going to lead us in that. The words are going to be on the screen, so even if you've got no idea about Spanish, you can still sing. It's going to be the same words as they are in English. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will sing, how great, how great is our God. I know it in English, not quite so good in Spanish, but the words will be there, so it's fine. Listen to Talia, listen to Pat, and uh, we'll have uh, a great time worshipping our God together. If you don't know any of the songs, don't worry. Just look at the words, listen to everybody around you uh, as we praise uh, the great God who has saved Jason, who has saved James, who has saved Pat. It's a glorious time, a uh, glorious moment to celebrate. So let's stand as the music starts and sing, How Great Thou Art, and then How Great Is Our God. Let's stand together.
Take a seat. We've sung in praise to our great God. I'm going to pray to our Heavenly Father. Sovereign Lord, you are God. Your covenant is trustworthy, and you have promised these good things to your servants. Father, thank you that you are the great God. Thank you that you are worthy of our praise. When we think of all that you have made, when we think of all that you have done, when we think of your great love to us, we thank you and we praise you. For your goodness to us. We thank you for all that you've done. For James, for Jason, for Pat. And thank you that as we sing in English, as we sing in Spanish, we know that we join our voices with those around the world who call upon the name of Jesus. Thank you that you are the great God. Thank you that you are worthy of our praise. And we commit our time to you this morning. In his glorious name. Amen. Just a few things going on in um, the life of the church. Uh, There's some events coming up uh, for uh, different groups within the church. Next Saturday, there's a women's brunch. So the women are getting together. Quarter past ten, half past ten, sometime in the morning. The organizer doesn't know what time it is. That makes me feel better. Come for about quarter past ten, that's fine. Um, Sign up the sheet at the back because that's where the time is. Um, And then you can come. Ten o'clock, it's getting earlier, half nine. Come at eight, be great. 
don't, don't, don't come at eight. Um, Sign-up sheet at the back. And then Thursday, so a week on Thursday, following that, uh, the women are bowling. No idea what time. Um, again, it's on the sheet. What I do know is that April the 3rd is a men's breakfast. That's at 8.30. I'm already hungry. When is it? <laughs> Apparently, April the 3rd is a Sunday. April the 3rd, pardon? Someone's birthday. It's your birthday. Shall I tell everybody? I won't tell anybody. Don't say it's Cheryl's birthday on April the 3rd. Um, April the 2nd, men's breakfast, 8.30 till 9.30. Um, I'm not organizing. So that's really good. Sorry, this is a really um, unhelpful segue. But, uh, so I need to tell you, I, we told last week that Dorothy Bennett uh, went to be with the Lord uh, when she was 100 years old. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful life lived for the Lord. Her funeral, it, and I've written this down, is April the 12th at 11 a.m. in here. So Tuesday um, April the 12th at 11 a.m. Um, in here. Uh, so do come if you can. Uh, it's uh, during uh, the Easter holidays. Uh, so if you knew and loved Dorothy and want to celebrate her life, then do join us uh, April the 12th at uh, 11 o'clock. That'll go out again on email. Uh, so if you didn't write it down, <laughs> that's okay. Dorothy's was a life uh, lived for uh, the Lord Jesus. And over the next few weeks in uh, our morning services and our uh, preparation for Easter, uh, we're going to have a, a little mini-series. Uh, what a surprise. Oh, there we are. I haven't got it. So you should all have seen one of those on your chair on the way in. Uh, it's about our Easter series, and we're going to watch a quick video um, just to publicize what's going on over the next few weeks. Thank you, John. <laughs> My name is Neil Tobman and I want to invite you along to three very special services we're holding here at Headley Park Church in the build up to Easter. On the 27th of March, the 3rd of April and the 10th of April, we are going to hear from three people who have been through some of life's toughest circumstances yet remain undefeated. On the 27th of March, we're going to hear from a mum who tragically her teenage son died. On the 3rd of April, we're going to hear from a soldier who fought in the Iraq war, but then came back and couldn't adjust to civilian life and wound up living on the streets. And on April the 10th, we're going to hear from a guy called Adam, who was a skeleton bobsleigh champion and then part of the International Olympic Organising Committee about how he's coped since he finished in elite sport. So on those three Sunday mornings, we are going to be interviewing each of these people about their different life-changing stories and how their faith in Jesus Christ has enabled them to remain undefeated. We hope you'll be able to join us. And if you can't, then you can always catch up on the Heavy Park YouTube channel. Great, so this is yours uh, to take away. There's also loads more. Uh, so if you want um, a handful, then please um, speak to Roy or speak to Neil at the back. Uh, that scared Roy. And um, take as many of these as you like. Uh, we've also got some copies of this book. This is called Gorilla Christian. Um, a fantastic evangelist wrote the answers to about um, 100 questions uh, about Christianity, God, and the Bible. Um, if you'd be interested in taking one of those for free, if you think someone you know would like one of those, then again, speak to the guys at the back and they'll give you one of those. Maybe in the run-up to Easter, there's someone that you think could really benefit from uh, reading that book. Wonderful. I think that's that for that bit. In a moment, in a moment, uh, the, the kids are going to uh, leave us and go to their clubs and classes. Basically, if you're up to year four, then head out that way, out the back and over to the hall over there. And the leaders over there will help you out. If you're year five, six and seven, don't go. You are meeting as normal, but not yet. Okay, And for those of you who are going, uh, you will be called back in before the baptism. So you will still get to see the baptisms, uh, teachers, parents, kids. You'll still get to see what's going on. But if you want to go, uh, drop the children off and come back. There'll be a time later on when you'll be sent out to go and see them. Okay, let's come back together. One of the most encouraging things for uh, a Christian is to hear somebody else's story, is to hear how um, someone else came to know and trust Jesus, and to hear the things that are in common with your story, and hear the things that are completely different from yours. And so we're going to hear 
uh, from James, from Pat, and from Jason, as they tell us their stories uh, and how they came to know and uh, trust the Lord Jesus. So, James, do you want to come up to the front? No. <laughs> I mean, we've got roving microphones. We can... Over to you, James. My normal spot is right at the back. I'm very <laughs> uncomfortable here. My name's James. Something Simon said recent, uh, recently really stood out. It's not about me. To get to know who it is about, though, you will have to hear about a bit about me. And I'm sorry for that. Anyway, how's it? If you can't quite place my accent, I was born in Zimbabwe when it was known as Rhodesia and grew up on a farm in the north of the country. As a family, we went to a local church, and I was christened in the Anglican tradition as a child. I went to Anglican junior and senior schools, and I was confirmed toward the end of my school years. From the outside, one might be forgiven for thinking I lived a charmed life, with everything anyone might ask for. Good family, beautiful home, food on the table, great schooling, a life full of adventure, holidays around the world, good friends, and a close community. I am also a victim of mental abuse. It's deeply cruel because there is no external evidence. <clears throat> Many have found it hard to believe, and on occasion, I have been made to feel a fool for suggesting it was even happening. Ultimately, this led to a very lonely existence, one filled with Self-doubt, self-loathing, selfish introspection, growing depression, and an inability to love. I found it hard to appreciate the very evident blessings in my life. After school, I turned to various worldly pursuits and teachings of different religions to provide meaning for life and an escape from the hurt inside. Every avenue provided only temporary relief from the mess. I did eventually come back to the Bible because I recognized its truth. I even called myself a Christian, but the way I lived would have turned anyone away from Jesus. In 2001, I moved to England, but still unable to find reason or hope, my life descended into a numb, disengaged struggle to get through each day, and I made endless poor choices. In late 2013, things went monumentally wrong. My wife left and subsequently divorced me. My dad died after a battle with cancer in Zimbabwe. <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. It's fine. I had an accident which meant I couldn't work for six weeks. Being self-employed, I had no income for that time. And the pressure of all these things piling on top of an already poor mental state caused such trauma that I completely broke down. No one could convince me of it. convince me of any reason to keep going and I was certain everyone including my children would benefit from not having me around. My sister in whom I was confiding couldn't help physically because she lives in Australia. In a moment of desperation she gave me a lifeline by suggesting I see my doctor. He is a good friend and a Christian, something that struck me immediately. Anyway, by the next morning he'd arranged for me get, to get into NHS funded counseling which started within two days. Early in my road to recovery, worldly lies continued to drive a lot of my motivations. One hangover from my years of depression saw me working on things that would improve how I appeared to the world. On some levels, the effort distracted me from the introspection, so it wasn't all negative, but it was exhausting. And there was always something bigger to aim for, so there was no rest available to me. What I came to realize in the day-to-day -day struggle after the worst times of my depression was that although I believed in God, I didn't have a personal faith. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. For me, the Bible was a great guide to living one, one's best life. Unfortunately, having a good guide for life gave no hope, reason, or purpose. 
I couldn't quite get to the place of peace and hope that Jesus promises. In 2020, I watched The Chosen. While my scientific reasoning and reading of the Bible hadn't brought to life Jesus' love for us, this show did. Human love had failed me for so long, I hadn't give God, given godly love a chance. His love doesn't vary depending according to my performance. His is a love that focuses on community, togetherness, forgiveness, and acceptance. Starting to believe that Jesus loves me in spite of my brokenness allowed me to start believing I'm worthy of my place in his life. <clears throat> John chapter 3, verse 16 really helped at the time, and I'm sure it's helped countless others. Jason, are you reading this later? Okay, I'll leave, I'll leave it for you. I've got another section. <laughs> anyway, that's when my intellect stopped being the way to understand the Bible, and my heart softened. I, I got it. No longer did I just believe that the main character in the story lived 2,000 years ago. I knew that Jesus is God, my Savior. I knew that I'm loved. Suddenly, life was filled with meaning, and I found hope. And evidence of this was the fact that that day my depression ended, a condition I'd been made to believe would continue to afflict me for the rest of my life because of the mental scarring was just gone. I can find no explanation for that other than that God healed me. I did the Alpha course online while we were locked down and unable to worship together. The leaders of that group are a great witness to the love and hospitality of Jesus and the group as a whole has been a very supportive. I believe that was God's protection over me because after coming to faith, I was faced with spiritual battles which tried to distract me from the certainty of my salvation. The fellowship of the Alpha Group struck me profoundly and a need to be part of a local church started to rise. Through a random meeting, <laughs> I found there are no coincidences in the way God works. And Adam, this is a shout out to you. God is using you more than you'd like to admit. <laughs> I heard that Headley Park Church was reopening its doors to in-person services before many other churches. I started coming here as soon as we were allowed into the building in 2021. In spite of my terrible state of mind, a lot of incredible people have stood by me throughout. Many are here today, some have driven across the country, and more are watching online from around the world. I've been in the prayers of more people than I'm aware. Randall. <laughs> who's been a great friend from, since I was at school in Zimbabwe, will be in the water with me today, and he's driven across from East Anglia. I'm getting baptized as a public declaration of the new life I have in Jesus. Jesus was baptized. Baptism following belief is commanded numerous times in the Bible. I would have been much, much, much more comfortable doing it privately with a couple of friends in a local river. <laughs> Lockdowns prevented that from happening, and I'm sure that was not coincidental. Neil got a chance to convince me that a public baptism would be a great witness to the power of the Lord in my life, which might even help others. It's not about me, remember. So this is the story of how Jesus continues to work for good in my life, even using the bad, how, uh, the bad bits for his purpose. Although I'm free from depression, I am still a sinner in need of a savior, needing to repent constantly for falling victim to the ongoing battle with the enemy's lies. This realization has led to an understanding that everyone is struggling with something. I'm able to start seeing what loving your neighbor and even your enemy looks like. I'm beginning to learn to trust and even learning how to forgive my abuser. Surely that is supernatural. I want to share with you another of the many incredible passages in the Bible which points to the love God has for us. Isaiah chapter 53. This is from the NIV translation and I'll only read a short section from the chapter. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. The rest of the chapter goes on to outline the whole of Jesus' life on earth. It was written between seven and 800 years before Jesus was even born. The Son of God chose to live as the lowliest of men, he who made everything, to whom everything owes its existence, walked this earth with none of the physical qualities that the world insists are important, the things that led to my depression and which I focused on. He took the burden of our sins on himself and died to set us free if we believe in him. Thank you, Jesus, for the peace and hope I find in you and for the support and encouragement of your extended family, my brothers and sisters. 
Great job. Great job. Great, third of the way through. <laughs> Just give James a chance to get around everybody. <laughs> Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Pat, so good to see you. So good to be here. For today, over to you. Wow. So many people. <laughs> Sounds hard. Good morning, everybody. It's an honor to be here to celebrate all the Baptists, all of them. I am so proud of all my brothers. It's a joy to have a Christian life. I had a life full of good moments, but as well a life full of pain and suffering. I was confused and disappointed about the world and the people. I didn't know how to deal with it. Five years ago, a friend started to talk to me about Jesus and how to turn from the past life of pain. I was an unbeliever and God was too much of a big word to me. But Jesus was my friend. It was a different approach. I needed to reach God and started believing in his son. Soon I had a need to know more about the Bible and they become months, months, years, and then the COVID come. During COVID, I had been perseverant with the same belief, the promises of God in Jeremiah 29, 19. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Today, I live with a new hope for life. Today, I believe in God, and I believe God is good, and I feel in my heart God is good. There is never too late to change your life and invite Jesus into your heart. I am being baptized today because I want the mark of God's people. I want to live the life God wanted to me to have in abundance in where death and suffering can be overcome in Jesus. And I will be made a new creature. Thanks to the people in Hurley Park Church for giving me the guide and the strength every day to be a Christian, because it's an everyday job. And you all be so good to me. I am here with my family today, and I'm, I'm so proud of the church, so proud of all of you guys, and I thank God for your presence and your love in my life. Um, God is good. God love you. Everything can be overcome in Jesus. Amen, guys. Yes, yes. That's one. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. And we are so proud of you two for standing here uh, and for professing your faith in the Lord Jesus. It is a glorious, glorious thing. Jason, can we complete the set? Good morning, everyone. I'd like to... Um, share my testimony on how I came to know Jesus. 
Um, I, was, I was raised in a family that was not of any religion, but we believed there was a God. Uh, we did not read any biblical books or attend church. We just tried to always be a good, loving family, believing that if you're good and kind, a caring person, you should go to heaven. Uh, but I now know after attending church, reading biblical scripture and watching Christian videos, that being a good person is not good enough to secure a place in heaven. I came to this realization after a friend at work who was a Christian, he said to me, um, it's okay being good, but being a good person is not um, good enough to be saved. Um, so he said, what I need to do is pray the salvation prayer to receive J Jesus in my heart to be truly saved. I now know that through repenting of your sins, confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he was sacrificed on the cross for our sins, and by believing in our hearts that he died on the cross and that God raised him from the dead after three days. Through this faith, we will be saved and have everlasting life. I was saved during the early part of the pandemic in March 2020, after I heard on the news about the coronavirus outbreak in the UK. I feared for the well-being of my family, so I did a lot of research into what could be done to protect myself and my family, which included researching prophylactic medicine, nutrition, correct hygiene, etc. All of this research brought me to God because of the realization how much disinformation and evil exists in this world. I started watching Christian podcasts and videos because I wanted to learn more about Christianity. Then on the 31st of March, 2020, I got down on my knees and I prayed the salvation prayer, as my friend had said. As I was praying and asking Jesus to come into my heart, I felt an overwhelming emotion of love and peace. Then all feelings of fear and doubt just vanished. It was hard to explain, but it was a very strong feeling of peace and love with a knowing in my heart that God is with me from this day onwards. After being saved, I wanted to come to church, but due to the lockdown restrictions, um, Neil and Simon weren't allowed to open. Uh, but one day I was working in my front garden and Neil, our pastor, was walking by and I mentioned that I would like to be baptised because my wife and children are christened, but I was not. Um, I love them so much that I did never want to be separated from them if I were to die and not uh, go to heaven. I thought being christened was the same as being saved or baptised, but I now know that this is not the same. So I open and pray my family will come to know our Lord and Saviour in the near future and be saved so we can have everlasting life together. Neil said he was unsure when the church would next be open for service, but he would drop off a Bible for me on his way back home from the church. Um, and he would keep me updated when church services start. I've now been coming to this church uh, almost every Sunday since July 2021. I am very blessed to have found such a great church family with so many kind and caring brothers and sisters that always go out of their way to make me and others feel so welcome. Um, recently, my family have gone through some stressful, tough times. My mum and dad were feeling unwell on the 8th of December, well, before the 8th of December, but they were rushed into hospital by ambulance on the 8th of December. Uh, they both had COVID, my mum had a collapsed lung, and my dad was just feeling unwell. But he's, he's, he's had cancer, so um, in that time, he's got a low, low immune system, so we have to be very careful. Um, so after 10 days of being in hospital, my dad died on the ventilator uh, due to a bl uh, bleed on the brain where he previously had the cancerous tumour. My mum was in hospital for two months uh, with a severely damaged lung, which collapsed multiple times. She was in and out of the um, uh, ICU. Um, so we were not allowed to visit them, visit them because of the COVID restrictions, but I managed to get a couple of Bibles from a friend um, from my mum and dad to read in hospital. And all we could do as a family was pray, pray for them every day. Mum started reading the Bible and praying for the first time in her life while, while she was in hospital. This had been a very, very sad and tough time for us all. 
Uh, but we are blessed that mum has come to know Christ through all his suffering. Mum is now recently saved and have come to know Jesus. I look forward to the day mum can attend church with me. I have a few personal, personal confirmations from God during my short time as a born again Christian. And from these confirmations, I have no doubt God is real and I'm enjoying my walk in faith with Christ. I'm learning a little bit more each day about the gospel. Our God is great and we as Christians are very blessed to know and love him. I would just like to read out a few short verses from, from the Bible, which have meaning to me. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 16. Um, this one for James. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. Another one is John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes through to the Father except through me. Matthew 7, 14. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are very few who find it. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. So encouraging. That verse that Jason read, there is one way to God. It is through Jesus. But there are hundreds and hundreds of ways to Jesus. And you've heard just three of them this morning. And if you know other Christians, ask them. Find out how they came to Jesus. And most will talk about the grace of God, God's undeserved kindness to us. And we're going to sing of that with another um, famous song. Uh, we're going to stand together as the music starts and sing Amazing Grace. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, during this song, um, Head Start Plus, so years uh, five, six, and seven are going to head out there and go upstairs. If you go downstairs, you'll get lunch early. Um, but yeah, head upstairs and off to uh, Head Start Plus uh, for that session. Let's stand and sing Amazing Grace.
fantastic seats. If you can grab one of these, uh, grab a Bible from the seat in front of you, uh, turn to page 1156. We in this church believe this is the Word of God. That's as it is read and faithfully explained that the Lord speaks. Uh, speaks to us, speaks to our hearts. And we're going to read, it's a big book. We're not going to read it all, but we're going to read a bit that describes what is the most important bit. If you want to condense all of this uh, into one little bit, um, this would be a good place to be. 1156, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Corinth is a place, and this was a letter written to a church in Corinth by a man called Paul. So when you see I, it's talking about Paul the Apostle. And I'm going to start where it says the resurrection of Christ next to the big 15 and go down to verse 11, the little 11, and it'll be on the screen behind me. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed." This is God's word. This is his word to us for this morning. And in a moment, Neil is going to come and speak to us from uh, that passage. Before he does, uh, I'm going to quickly pray, and then we're going to sing again. Let me pray. Our great God and heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that through your word you speak to us, that the great God, the one who is above all things, the great creator, the eternal one, speaks to his people. And we praise you. Father, I pray that we would have open eyes, open minds, open hearts, open ears to you today. That just as you have spoken to James and to Pat and to Jason. Oh Lord, speak to each of us today, we pray. Use Neil. That as we hear his words, we would hear you speaking to us. And Father, as we pray for ourselves, we pray for those around the world. And we particularly pray for those in Ukraine at the moment. For Christians who are longing to meet as normal this Sunday morning, and yet maybe you're unable to, and for the country as a whole, and for Ukrainians who are spread out across Europe and beyond as they've left their own country. Father, we pray for peace. We pray for your gospel uh, to take hold in that nation. We pray for Vladimir Putin. We pray for his advisors. We pray, Lord, that you would bring an end to this conflict. Father, we realize that there is a battle for our soul. And I pray that as we stand firm, as we put on the armor of God, as we focus upon the Lord Jesus, that you will lead us on and that we will overcome. Father, thank you for these words. Thank you for the gospel. We praise you for your work in our lives. And pray that you would lead us on in Christ. For we ask it for his eternal glory. Amen. Just before Neil comes to speak, we're going to stand again as the music begins and sing, O Church Arise, and put your armor on. Let's stand together.
Hallelujah. Let's have a seat. Well, it's been an emotional morning, hasn't it? I cried three times. Didn't expect that. Got done. It's usually the other way around. I normally say something and set you all off. It's not fair being on the other end. What a glorious morning it's been. I want you to use your imagination as we start this morning. I'm guessing like me, most mornings, maybe at the moment, you're flicking on the news. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are living in Ukraine and that you are a Ukrainian. And tomorrow morning, you flick on the news and this is the headline. Vladimir Putin is dead. War is over. There's peace. The new government in Russia is friendly to Ukraine. They've agreed to pay for the war in full. They're going to mobilize the might of Russia to rebuild Ukraine better than before. All the refugees around Europe will be brought safely home. How good would you feel? I mean, even just saying that, I feel good. And we're a thousand miles away from the front line, more than. And yet, I reckon that's the longing of most of our hearts in this room, isn't it? That there would be war over, peace would come, Ukraine restored, refugees home. That's what we want. You know, the news I want to tell you about here this morning, if I explain it right and you understand it, is even better than if that happened tomorrow. Because the Bible says that in all of our hearts, there's a war on. That when we're born, we're born hostile to the God who made us. Our hearts are at war with him. You've heard a bit about that from our three friends here this morning. They didn't start out as Christians. They became Christians. The war came to an end. And they now know God through Jesus Christ. So I want to explain to you this morning the most important message you will ever hear. Listen to what I'm claiming. I'm not claiming I'm the greatest preacher who ever lived. Therefore, this will be the greatest talk you've ever heard. There are people in this room who are better talkers than me. But here's the thing. There's no greater message than this. This is of first importance. So get your Bibles open in front of you this morning at that passage that Simon read out for us. Page 1156. And we're going to dive into this together now. Uh, Picking up at verse 1 of chapter 15. It says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. I want to remind you, Paul says. He wrote this letter to the Corinthians about 55 AD, and five years before, he'd been living in the city with these guys. Um, You may or may not know where Corinth is. It's actually in modern-day Greece, I almost forgot where it was then. It's in Greece. But when you think of a city, when you hear Corinth mentioned in the Bible, the city you should think of is Las Vegas. I don't know if any of you have been to Vegas. I won't ask because I know what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, Corinth was that kind of place. Corinth was a party town full of sailors having fun. It was Sin City. And in 50 AD... Paul, and, and Jewish people were named often because of a characteristic, it meant small. So probably a little, like me, I always wanted to be tall, little guy like me walks into Vegas, going down the strip, everyone's having a good time. There's on average a thousand prostitutes at work a night in Corinth, male and female, busy, busy time. And Paul looks around having been beaten to a pulp recently for talking about Jesus, literally whipped within an inch of his life, still bearing the scars, looks at party town and says, you know what these people need? They need Jesus. That's exactly right. They need Jesus. How do you think he got on? Would you want that gig? If you felt the Lord saying to you, I want you to go to Vegas, walk up the strip and say, you get on talking about Jesus. Well, Paul was a brave man. He'd been beaten already, but actually the Bible tells us how he got on, and it's a surprise. So Dr. Luke, in his book called The Acts of the Apostles, just has these few sentences that sum up what happened. So many of the Corinthians, many in party town, who heard Paul believed and were baptized. 
One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, don't be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you. No one's going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching the word of God. What a surprise. You see, the word of God, which we're looking at this morning, is powerful. It cuts right through to the heart. And even in party town, even in Sin City, it has its effect. And so Paul was teaching this good news. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you that time I was with you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise, you believed in vain. So the first thing we see here is it's a message of how God saves. By this gospel, you are saved. The Bible says this is the only way that we can be saved. It's the only way that war can come to an end. So while the war in Ukraine might be more than a thousand miles away, the war in us is right here. It couldn't be any closer. And the Bible says, through this gospel message, you're saved. War comes to an end. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, you're saved and you go on being saved. So you're saved in your past. There's a moment like these guys have described here this morning, where Jesus puts his hand on you, and the life you are living comes to an end, and a new life begins. And in that moment, you're saved from the penalty of sin. These three have no reason to be afraid now. Everything they've ever done wrong, every word they've said that was bang out of order, every thought they've had that shamed them, everything that would drag them down, now has written over them no condemnation, paid for in full by Jesus Christ. Their past penalty of sin, they are saved from. But you know what? They're going on being saved. They're going on being saved from the power of sin in their lives. One time, and I won't tell you who, when I was baptizing someone's husband from this community, she said, when he gets in there, can you just put your foot on him and hold him down? (laughs) Now, I didn't, and I won't ask if anyone feels that way here this morning, because it ain't going to happen. But these guys are still a work in progress. Do you know what? I was baptized more than 30 years ago, now two days after my 18th birthday. 16th of June, 1991, I'm an old man. So for 30 years, I've been a work in progress. You ask my wife, she'll tell you there's a lot of progress still to be done. I was saved when I was 17 and three quarters, baptized at 18. I I had that moment, no condemnation over Neil Todman, but I'm a work in progress. I'm still being saved from the power of sin and selfishness in my life. And do you know what? One day, I will be saved. I will see King Jesus, as will everyone who's trusted in him. Every eye and heart shall see him. And on that day, I will be saved for all eternity. And the penalty of sin which was dealt with, the power of sin will be broken. And the presence of sin will be gone because Jesus saves. He saves. He saves sinners. He saves the worst of people and the best of people and everything in between through the gospel. He saves. And on this gospel, we take our stand here in this church. It's what we are all about from start to finish. The gospel, the good news of Jesus. These three have taken their stand from behind this lectern here. Not one of them was looking forward to doing it. Could you tell? Not one of them a public speaker. Not one of them wanting to do that except that you might hear their story. And weren't we blessed? Wasn't it good to hear that story? Maria, I'm sure in hospital this morning you were deeply blessed as your son shared his testimony. And as a church, we pray for you, we love you, we long that you're going to get well again, and we look forward to the day you're here with us. So I hope you know the Lord with you in hospital even this morning. On this gospel, we take our stand. We take our stand. And what does Paul say about that gospel? He says... By this gospel you're saved if you hold firmly to the word I've preached to you. James, Pat, Jason, hold on tight. Life has its ups and its downs. 
but Jesus is faithful through it all. Hold on to this gospel. It's like a lifeline, like a rope. Don't let go. The saddest thing for me as a pastor, I've been doing this now for 20 years, is to see people who are passionate in their 20s, drifting in their 30s, moving away from Jesus further in their 40s. And I've done funerals of people where I no longer knew if they knew Christ at all. Don't let that be you. Hold on tight to this gospel, firmly to this message. It will hold you fast. So Paul says that, and you might think, well, what is this message? You you banged on about it. What is the message? Well, the gospel message is all about God's king. That's what Christ means. It wasn't when he was in school that his surname was Jesus Christ. You know, it's like Jesus Baker, and then he was next in the register. You know, it was Christ was a title. It meant king. He was actually known as Jesus of Nazareth, or the carpenter's son. But people came to believe he was actually the king that had been promised for a thousand years to Israel. The king who would come and put all things right with this world and this universe even. And so it says here, for what I received I passed on to your first importance. Nothing more important that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. You know, he could only die for our sins because he had none of his own. There isn't one of us here who could stand on our own track record and say, I've always got it right. I've always loved God every minute of every day. I've always treated others as I should. But I've read this. And Jesus does that. He lives an exemplary life of love towards God. And because he loves God, he loves others. He loves the the most outcast and the least. He goes after folks with love to show them how they can live for his Father in heaven. And then he does the most amazing thing. If war spread across Europe, right, up to 60, the Ukrainian men are being called up. And I I thought I was clear. You know, I thought I was way old for fighting. But it turns out not. Up to 60. Imagine that. I'd be fighting for queen and country, wouldn't I? So would many of you here. Proud to do so. I don't be very good, but I'd be proud to give it a go. But I'd be fighting for her, wouldn't I? For country. Here's the thing. The king of the universe fought for his people. He went into battle alone, abandoned by his troops. And there he bled and he died, carrying your sin and mine on his shoulders. He died for our sins. And he was really dead. That's why... Paul says, and he was buried. So people couldn't say he wasn't really dead. No, no, he was buried. But thank God the story doesn't end there. Because the second thing you need to know about this gospel is this. On the third day, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. What an amazing thing. You see, the Romans killed thousands of people on crosses. That wasn't unusual. Thousands died. Here's the unusual thing. One came back from the dead. One broke out of the tomb. We sometimes sing here, and I love these two lines, so listen carefully. Jesus is Lord. The tomb is gloriously empty. Not even death could crush this king of love. Isn't that an amazing hope? An amazing hope. Christ has won the victory even over death. And as our brothers and sisters sister are baptized. That's what's being pictured here. As they go down into this pool, it's as if they're going down into their own grave. It even looks a bit like it, doesn't it? It's about the same size. Like they're going down into death and saying, my old life is gone. It's buried here with me as I go under the water and it's washed away. I'm clean. And then they come up out of the water. At least we hope they do. They come up out of the water resurrected, as it were, a picture of them living a new resurrection life in the power of Jesus. That's what you're going to see here today. Now, today's stories were emotional, about overcoming adversity in all three cases, delivered with real strength and conviction. But you don't have to throw your brain out to be a Christian. 
Do you see what Paul says here? He says, why should you believe Jesus really died? Why should you really believe he came back from the dead? You people in Corinth who didn't see these things, that happened 20 years ago. Why should you believe? And he says, you should believe he died because he was buried. And you should believe he rose from the dead because I've got a list of witnesses here. He says, first of all, to Cephas, who's Peter, one of his best friends. Then to the 12, the other guys who Jesus hung out with and had seen him throughout his whole ministry from when it began to when it ended, from when he was raised and went back to heaven, they'd seen it all. He says then this, after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Then he appeared to James, his half-brother, then to all the apostles, and then last of all to me. So Paul says you don't have to just, you know, kind of believe if you feel it's true in your heart. No, no, no. Paul says this either happened or it didn't. Either all these people are liars or Jesus really rose from the dead. 500. Imagine you're called up for jury service. I've dodged that twice now, so at some point I'm going to have to do it. But the um, jury service, imagine you were there and you're on a jury of 12 And someone makes a claim that doesn't sound very credible, like someone rose from the dead. And the lawyer starts calling up witnesses. And there's 10, and they all say, yeah, no, we saw him last Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it's definitely him. He had the scars from where he died, hole in his side. Yeah, it's definitely him. Well, it's 10. The judge says, well, that's 10. And, you know, I think we're getting the picture here. And how many more have you got? And he goes, oh, we've got another 490 in the back. Do you want to hear from all of them? 490 witnesses, do you want to hear them all? They'll all tell you the same story. Wouldn't you sit up and listen? That's what Paul's saying here. Person after person, and he's saying some have fallen asleep, they've died, but most haven't. You want to have a word with Doris down the street? Go and find her, she'll tell you. She'll tell you what happened. You know, Doris tells the truth, got no reason to lie. In fact, if she's lying about this, she's likely to wind up arrested. She's not likely to lie. You don't have to throw your brain out to believe this, Paul says. Look at the evidence. Look at the evidence. If Jesus really died, and then he really rose again, that's a game changer, isn't it? That's a game changer. Because death is coming, isn't it? My Uncle Jack was in the Merchant Navy. He came to visit my mum when I'd just been born. I'd been a really poorly baby. Right, really poorly, on an incubator. And uh, then when I was out, my uncle came, and he had big pirate arms, you know, with the big um, anchor tattoos. And there was little baby Neil, sickly little baby, gathered in his arms. There I was, tiny little me, and he turns to my mum, Vanda, who's half Polish, says, Vanda, do you want to know the one thing you can say for certain about this little boy? He's one day nearer death. <laughs> How bad is that? My mum burst into tears. So I don't tell you this as a good example. Men, don't, don't pick up on that as a way to behave. However, it's true, isn't it? For all of us, it's a truism. The only one it wasn't true for was Jesus. And he says he can bring you through the waters of death and out the other side. That's the kind of saviour he is. Now you might be here this morning, you've listened to these wonderful stories, you've listened to this amazing message, you might be thinking, how does that happen? How do you go from being like I am, where I don't really believe I'm happy if other people do, but it's not really for me, to a point of belief? to a point where actually you're as convicted as these three are, or as I am, or others that you know. How does that happen? Look at what Paul says next. Verse 8 says, And last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Then he says, For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No. I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it's I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. How does someone come to believe? The Apostle Paul had a massive change of direction. He persecuted the church. He hated Christians and the Christian message so much. He had Christians rounded up and killed. 
But one day, he was on the road to Damascus, and you may know this story, and a bright light appeared to him. And it was a vision of the risen Lord Jesus Christ that said, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? And having seen the risen Lord Jesus, actually been blinded by him temporarily, Paul began that journey of faith, of putting his trust in Jesus, realizing Jesus died on the cross for his sins, and there was no other savior, no other king, no other God but Jesus. And so his life turned around. But you see the word he uses to describe that? Repeatedly in here, again and again and again. He says here, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yeah, not I, but the grace of God that was with me. It's grace. It's a hard thing to explain. Some people like to explain it as Christ's riches. No, God's riches at Christ's expense. I nearly got that wrong. That, all that, that would have spelled. God's riches at Christ's expense. Some people like to explain it that way. I think of it, I was thinking about this again yesterday. I think it is actually God's grace is God is at his best meets us at our worst. God at his best meets us at our worst. And it just changes our lives completely. We've sung it today, haven't we? It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. You know, we began today imagining war being over in Ukraine, Putin dead, a rebuild of that nation. I want you to finish by imagining something else here this morning. Imagine that in a moment's time, you just cry out to God, please forgive me. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he rose from the dead and he's the king of all and I want him to be king and lord of my life. Imagine you cry out that prayer from your heart. No one else knows. Let me tell you what will be true for you when you wake up tomorrow morning. Your old life will be over. War between you and God, finished. You'll be at peace with God. Jesus will have died on the cross for all of your sin. God will be your friend. And all the resources of heaven will be being deployed to restore your life. And the king of the universe will bring you safely home. It's the greatest message for anyone there can ever be. The question for all of us is, do we believe it? Is that the place where we've taken our stand? Are we holding on to it tightly? Has God's amazing grace found you here even this morning. Let me pray. Father God, we want to thank you so much for the power of the gospel to change hearts and change lives. We thank you that it ends the war between us and you so we can be forgiven, set free, made new. And Father, we pray for any here this morning listening to this who know they've been spoken to by you that even in these moments, they would feel that amazing grace touching their hearts and bringing belief to life within them. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing an amazing hymn now. Um, we've already sung Amazing Grace. I'm not going to do that again. We're going to sing In Christ Alone. Then we're going to take a break, okay, just for a few minutes. So if you do need a comfort break, it'll be a great time to get one. And those of you with children in the creche, you can bring them back. We like to have everyone in at the end for these baptisms. Uh, and um, we're going to get changed and ready. So that after we've sung, there'll be a five-minute little break. And then the baptisms will take place. Parents, if you've got children, do supervise them. But they can come onto the platform here. We don't get them to get any nearer for fear of baptizing more people than we want to in one morning. Uh, but they can sit up here. And uh, you'll be able to see what's going on on the screen. But in the middle one for Pat, if you need to move to see, because we're not going to show that one on the screen, you can stand up, okay? You can move to get where you need to to see what's going on, okay? But for now, we're going to stand and sing our penultimate hymn in Christ alone. Let's stand and sing. Oh, 
Loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that every word we have sung is truth, and truth sets us free. Lord, help us to believe, help us to live according to your amazing grace, and your amazing love, and your amazing power, that Jesus might be seen. For we ask these things in his name, and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Do you have a seat? We're going to take a couple of minutes break, because it's I'm going to get changed if no, rather than we're all getting changed. So uh, if you haven't got your children back, find where they've gone, retrieve them from the crèche if you need to, bring them back, and then we'll get them up on the platform. And what's amazing is that this is just a picture, but it tells of something amazing. And the amazing thing, no one's listening, it doesn't matter, does it? I'll, just, I'll talk to you is that they've had their sins, all of that dirt, washed away by Jesus. And that's an amazing thing. So there's nothing special about the water. It came out of the tap. It's going to go down the plug hole. Nothing special about me or about Neil or about Katie or about Randall. The thing that's special is Jesus and what he's done in James and Pat and Jason's lives. And that is a wonderful thing. So when we go in the water, we're showing that they've gone, said goodbye to their old life and hello to a new life in Jesus. And that is an amazing thing. So, James, Randall. Give a wave. <laughs> okay, James. It to be a lot about no, it's really not. Um, I'm going to ask you two questions, and the answer is I do. I know the answer is you do, so it's fine. Um, James, uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died to save you from your sin? I do. Do you turn from your sin and promise to follow him day by day, obeying him as Master and Lord? I do. Then on the confession of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, nothing's gone wrong with the tech. You will be able to see the next one on the screen for reasons we're not going to explain. This one, if you need to move to see, if you want to stand and move around so you can see better into the pool, you're very welcome to do so. Um, children, you can't move anywhere further forward, so you stay where you are. But any of the grown-ups that want to, feel free to stand or move. There's plenty of room around at the front. Um, if you want to see this closer up, you are very, very welcome. Particularly family members, if you want to come nearer the front so you can see, very, very welcome. Pat, I'm going to ask you the same two questions. Pat, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died to save you from your sin? I do. Do you turn from your sin and promise to follow him day by day, obeying him as your master and Lord? I do. Then on your confession of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.
Here we go. So, it is a new person. Someone down at the front here noticed it's someone new. We're not baptized in the same person three times. New person each time. Jason's turn this time. Jason, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died to save you from your sin? I do. And do you turn from your sin and promise to follow him day by day, obeying him as your master and Lord? I do. Then on your confession of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Give me a lot of drips. Well, that was a very exciting way to finish this morning's service. I hope most of you, if not all of you, are going to stay for lunch. Whether you're booked in or not, doesn't matter. You're very welcome. You're here this morning. You want to stay, then do stay. There's going to be lunch downstairs. And once you've been served downstairs, you can either stay downstairs. We're going to set some tables up here too. So you can bring your lunch back up here. And that way we'll spread out. And I'm hoping to have a good chat with people and catch up after the service. As we finish, we're going to sing one last time. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. The Apostle Paul said it wasn't him who did these things. It was the grace of Jesus. We're going to finish today by singing about that grace now. Let's stand together and sing. Why we did. 
Well, it's been good to be together this morning. You're part of a record-breaking event for our church. This is the longest service we've ever done. Uh, so if you survive this, you'll, be, you'll manage any other week easily. So yeah, we welcome any week you're around. And uh, we're going to break for lunch now. If you go through those doors and down the stairs or out and round, don't come round the back because we're all going to be getting changed in different rooms. So that could be a nasty shock. Uh, go that way and down and round. And uh, the baptismal candidates will join you again in a few moments' time. Thank you for coming this morning. God bless you all.